I'm sitting in Marden Henge, the largest henge in the British Isles. It encloses a space of about 15 hectares and it's so large that when you walk through the fields here you can't actually see every bit of it at the same time. And this has the side effect of disappointing visitors because they're expecting something like Avebury. But when you look at it in plan or as an aerial view you can see just how huge this monument is. So I'm sitting on the northern bank of Marden Henge. Of course back in the Neolithic period this would have been much larger. The ditch in front of me is now full, it is now full but would have been a good three or four meters deep. So you have to imagine those three or four meters placed back on the top of this bank. It would have looked impressive. A henge monument is a bank and ditch enclosure usually with the ditch in front of the bank. What happened inside these large enclosures is still unknown but clearly they were used for ceremonial activity. We find henge monuments all over the British Isles. They often have various architectural features within them. Sometimes we find timber circles, sometimes such as Avebury there's a stone circle. We don't know whether Marden ever had a stone circle. There's some evidence that it once had a timber circle. But other features that uh, we find inside henges include mounds. And Marden Henge did once have a huge mound. In fact, if I'd been sat on this bank in the Neolithic period, in front of me would have been one of the largest mounds in Wiltshire indeed possibly the country. It was said by antiquarians to be as much as 15 metres high. By 1807 we know that it had been somewhat eroded but still a pretty substantial mound. So big in fact that two very famous antiquarians, Richard Coulthor and William Cunnington, excavated a shaft from the top right the way down to the bottom. They were hoping to find a wealthy burial in the middle, well they didn't. But the men working in that shaft were called off their labours just in time and as they came out of the, the shaft there was a huge landslide and the shaft itself collapsed in. This must have seriously disfigured the mound and one can only imagine what it must have looked like. But some years later Richard Coulthor came back to visit the mound and he writes that he had the unexpected mortification to discover that the Hatfield Barrow had been entirely levelled. The farmer had presumably taken um, the opportunity of the disfigured mound just to get rid of it altogether. Perhaps he sold off the material um, uh, to, to, to others to enrich their land or perhaps he just spread it around uh, within the enclosure itself, but whatever. Now, in front of me, I see nothing, just an open field. The mound has almost entirely gone. I say entirely, but five years ago, in 2010, I excavated across the footprint of the mound, and we found that there was 15 centimetres of it still surviving. And that's lucky for us, because within that 15 centimetres we uncovered some bone, some animal bone, and we were able to get a radiocarbon date on it. And we know that that mound is the same date as the enclosure itself, around 2450 BC. So would the mound have been here? Yeah. between where we are and the cars. Yep, so it would have been between where the rough grass is, just overlapping with that, 
possibly as high as that uh, big tree in Sue's Garden. Following the work in 1807 into the large mound within the Henge, no other archaeological work took place until 1969. And that's when archaeologist Geoffrey Wainwright excavated over the northern entrance, which is just to my left here. I'm now on the bank of the, of the River Avon and it's been known for some time that late Neolithic henge monuments like Marden Henge are somehow associated with rivers and watercourses and springs. Marden Henge is no different. The south side of it is entirely unenclosed and instead the River Avon forms this southern side of it. And then, on the south side of the river, we have the Wilsford Henge, with its entrance opening to the north, again pointing down towards the River Avon. These monuments appear to be strung out along the River Avon. And so we continue down the river, we can see Dowington Walls, another big late Neolithic henge enclosure linked with the River Avon. And then further downstream, we have Stonehenge with its famous avenue that leads out of the stone circle and straight to the River Avon. The River Avon is the key element in all these sites and is of key importance in understanding the monuments themselves and how we interpret them. Could it be that people moved like some sort of pilgrimage between these monuments, using them one after the other as they progressed downstream or perhaps upstream? or perhaps at different times of the year. At the moment we simply don't know, but with projects like this, we're beginning to fill those gaps.